my introductory remarks, but I want to just share with you a few facts about Professor Gage's background and distinguished career. Uh, Professor Gage got her BA at Yale. She took a brief detour to New York City to get a PhD at Columbia, and then prom oh, thank you, and then promptly returned to New Haven, where she has been teaching in the history department now for 20 years. She is currently the John Lewis Gaddis Professor of History at Yale. During her time there, she has won the Ribicoff Award for Teaching Excellence in the college. She has chaired the Faculty of Arts and Sciences Senate. And from 2017 to 2021, she served as the director of Yale's Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy, some of whose alums may be among our students. Um, in 2021, President Biden uh, nominated her to serve on the National Humanities Council, which is the advisory board for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Her first book, uh, which I urge all of you to read, if you've already sampled Hoover, you'll, you'll want more. Her first book was The Day Wall Street Exploded, a story of America in its first age of terror. And it examined the history of terrorism in the United States, domestic uh, uh, violent extremism, we would say today in the early 20th century, focusing on what was the largest terrorist act up until that point, a tremendous bombing of Wall Street. Uh, that book formed the basis for a PBS documentary film. I don't know whether there's a movie version of G-Man in the works. <laughs> but uh, of course, you all know about her wonderful second book, G-Man, J. Edgar Hoover, and the Making of the American Century. Uh, that book won the Pulitzer Prize in biography, contrary to the dust jacket of the hardcover. I know, on the hardcover, they <laughs> screwed it up, yeah. Which, which awarded you the Pulitzer Prize in history, but, you know, a Pulitzer <laughs> is pretty good, whichever category it's in. It also won the Bancroft Prize in American History and Diplomacy, which I can tell you as a former U.S. History graduate student is the most uh, esteemed prize, I would say, in U.S. History. It won the National Book Critics Circle Award in Biography and many other prizes. Uh, so we are very, very lucky to have Professor Gage with us. I have to add just two uh, more parochial notes about Professor Gage's connections to GW. Um, she is both a parent of a GW student, and as she mentions at the tail end of her book, the granddaughter of a GW law grad, someone who actually went through the law school uh, in almost the same era as Hoover, uh, just about at the same time as Hoover's uh, lifelong companion, Clyde Tolson. So Professor Gage has uh, very deep ties not only to Yale and New Haven, but also to GW here. I uh, will start out uh, asking Professor Gage some questions, and uh, I hope, but I hope we will certainly have time uh, to uh, have folks in the audience jump in and also ask you some questions about uh, Hoover and the FBI and growth of the American uh, federal, the federal government over the course of the 20th century and so on. So with that as background, um, let me begin sort of at the beginning, which is um, how and why did you come to select Hoover as a subject? Um, well, thanks for that softball question to start out. Um, well, and thanks there will be no hardball questions, <laughs> uh, not from this chair. <laughs> Being here, I, I hear that lunch will appear magically at some point. But yes, um, in the, the box meantime, lunches are on their way. In the meantime, uh, we'll just chat. Um, it's a good question for any number of reasons. Um, one of which is that often when people ask me why I decided to write a biography about J. Edgar Hoover, what they really mean is, why would you decide to write a biography about J. Edgar Hoover? Right. Um, uh, a figure who is not widely loved and admired in our own day and time. And of course, uh, the reason that I came to writing a biography of Hoover was not that I was such a big Hoover fan. Uh, but there are a couple of things that drew me to him. Uh, one, you mentioned my first book, The Day Wall Street Exploded. Um, and that's actually really where I met J. Edgar Hoover as a historical figure. Um, that was uh, primarily about a bombing in 1920 that happened on Wall Street. And he was already there doing some of that work uh, as the 25-year-old head of a little division in the Justice Department called the Radical Division. And what struck me about seeing him in this young capacity was, first of all, 
oh my gosh, J. Edgar Hoover was once young. <laughs> not, not as we see him here on the cover of the book, or as most of us think about him as this kind of late life power broker. Uh, but it was also interesting to me that he, as a young man, was coming to so many of the ideas and practices that would go on to be so influential over the course of the 20th century. Uh, Anti-communism really being central then uh, and afterwards to his identity. And then, you know, that he was there on the ground floor as the federal government was starting to try to figure out how it was going to keep tabs on American citizens and non-citizens in new ways. Um, all of that was being invented, and he was part of that story. So I thought he was a great vehicle to kind of take that story from this very early stage um, and get us up through most of the 20th century. And he kind of had his fingers in everything, and that was appealing to me, too. Wonderful. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, Hoover himself, and then we'll, we'll, we'll also uh, head to some of those broader themes. But starting with uh, Hoover, you know, he was a local boy made good a D.C. native who born in 1895 on Capitol Hill, not far from where Eastern Market is today. How, how did the, the social world that uh, Hoover was born into influence his uh, trajectory, his, his values, his career, and so on? Yeah, this really is a Washington book in lots and lots of ways. Hoover was born in Washington in 1895. He died here in 1972. He never lived anywhere else. In fact, he only had two homes. Uh, one is this home on Seward Square, Capitol Hill. If any of you know where the Capitol Hill Methodist Church is, um, that was the site of Hoover's old uh, childhood home where he lived with his mother until he was 43 years old. And then he moved over into an area called Forest Hills, sort of out by Chevy Chase. And that was his only other residence. So he is a DC native uh, his whole life. And I think it's really important to his story. First of all, um, he's born into a kind of middle-class government service family, a family that even in the late 19th century kind of had a tradition of nonpartisan government service that was different from being involved in politics because in this era, DC residents did not join political parties. They didn't vote. Um, and so Hoover grows up in this kind of world of progressive era government service, is trained in that world, has lots of aspirations in it, and he kind of holds on to that tradition for much of his life. And then the second thing that's really important about DC is that this is a city in the late 19th century an early 20th century that is undergoing a very formal process of racial segregation. And so on the question of race, as well as on a lot of other kind of social issues of the day, he really grows up in a kind of conservative Southern atmosphere that was a lot of the political culture of D.C. in that moment. Um, he makes his way through segregated institutions. The Washington public school system was formally segregated. GW, where he goes to school, was, of course, a segregated institution at the time, and federal employment itself was becoming segregated in much more rigid ways when, when he entered federal work. Excellent. Well, of course, I have to ask you a little bit more about GW and J. Edgar Hoover, um, given where we are. Why, why did Hoover wind up studying at GW and studying law in particular? So Hoover, I think, was um, a little bit overdetermined as a GW student, which is to say that his brother, his older brother, who was 15 years older, um, had also gone here. And uh, it was kind of the thing that you did if you were uh, a middle class boy in Washington, D.C., uh, without necessarily a lot of money to move somewhere else and go to school. Uh, GW was the place that you went if you had aspirations to government service. Um, so it was a pretty natural move for Hoover. He graduated from Central High School, which was then uh, kind of the premier white public high school in Washington, D.C., um, and came straight to GW. Now, at the time that he entered GW, um, the law degree was an undergraduate degree. So in that sense, he went straight into law school. And the other interesting feature is that it was mostly a night school at the time. So Hoover, like many of his fellow students, uh, worked for the government by day and then attended his classes at night. 
And that was true of a lot of the different uh, professional programs uh, that were at GW at the time. Um, that was kind of the standard track. And the day students were the, were the strange ones. <laughs> And um, how, how did GW influence Hoover and the FBI? Uh, how, did the, how did GW, you know, uh, play an important role in how he pursued his early career? Well, I think there are three things that really happened during his college years that are enormously influential. So one, GW is, of course, the place uh, that J. Edgar Hoover learns the law. So um, thank you, GW, for uh, for that. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. He was a very careful lawyer at many points in his career. He was, absolutely. Um, and he was apparently a very, very serious and meticulous law student. So he had been valedictorian at his high school, which was uh, a very prominent, very kind of strivery, competitive high school. And so he was really a star student. He was a debater. He was a very serious go-getter. And you can actually see that in his uh, in his law school notebooks. He kept them all. So if you want to go read uh, <laughs> what it was like to be a GW student, and it's all very careful script. It's super meticulous. Um, interestingly, you know, a lot of the things that we would think is pretty foundational for law school, and certainly foundational for a figure like Hoover. He doesn't appear to have studied. They don't appear to have been a big part of the GW curriculum. So he does not appear to have taken a constitutional law class. And he does not appear to have taken a criminal law class either. Um, a lot of what he took uh, were various other forms of um, a kind of law that was supposed to prepare him for government service in one capacity or another. But it was interesting to me that that in a formal sense, I don't think he ever took one of those two classes. But uh, he was a very serious law student. He actually stayed here an extra year and got his master's in law as well, which turns out to be very important for the timing of when he graduated. Uh, he spent his daytime when he was in law school working at the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. The Library of Congress also taught him a very important skill set, which was how to uh, classify and manage information. This is a period when the Library of Congress classification system is just coming into being. And so Hoover's sort of immersed in what was then sort of the information technology of its age uh, during this time. And then the last thing that he becomes part of at GW uh, is his fraternity, a fraternity called Kappa Alpha, which was to me one of the most important and surprising pieces of his early biography. Uh, Kappa Alpha was an explicitly white Southern fraternity. It had been created in 1865 to honor uh, the lost cause of the South, the memory of Robert E. Lee. And by the time Hoover joined it in the early 20th century, um, it was a pretty avowedly uh, segregationist fraternity. It was a fraternity deeply immersed in sort of the political networks in D.C. of Southern Democrats. Um, it was in many ways an avowedly racist fraternity, but its culture really was this culture of uh, the Southern lost cause of uh, kind of glorification of the Confederacy. And so Hoover himself was really immersed in that kind of political culture. And I think Kappa Alpha uh, helped to solidify sort of his racial ideology as he was coming of age as a young man. Mm -hmm. Did he maintain his ties with GW later? We were just, uh, before uh, we started, I was mentioning to Professor Gage that uh, some of you may know there is a J. Edgar Hoover graduate seminar room plaque in our law school that has floated around for many decades, which made me curious, did he keep in touch with GW? He did. Not only did he keep in touch with GW, but he loved GW, and it was really his prime recruiting ground for FBI agents for many years. So he became head of the Bureau, we'll get there, uh, in 1924 when he was just 29 years old. Um, and he immediately set about hiring all of these men that he thought uh, reflected his education, his values, who were going to be his friends and his close companions. Um, Clyde Tolson being one of them, but uh, he maintained his ties to GW. He hired an entire generation of early FBI officials out of GW um, and the Alumni Association at GW for decades and decades would do, you know, kind of Hoover Awards and Hoover celebrations and all this. I suspect they're not doing as much of that anymore, but it was, it was a big thing uh, in the middle of the 20th century. 
Wow. Okay. Well, so you mentioned that while uh, Hoover was in law school, he was working at the Library of Congress. And of course, most people would not associate the word librarian with J. Edgar Hoover. But as you say, it was an important training ground for organizing information, which became one of his uh, lifelong uh, devotions and uh, sources of his power. Um, but let's look at what he did after he got out of school. Uh, he started out at the Justice Department in 1917, I believe. Clo we're getting close to the end of World War I, but not quite. And um, uh, as you describe in the book, uh, one of the areas in which he first took on substantial responsibility was in the uh, anti-radical crackdowns uh, in the years right after World War I. Um, what, did, what did those early experiences as a government investigator uh, show about Hoover's abilities, his limitations, his approach to that kind of work as he was just starting out. <laughs> well, I mentioned that he stayed at GW for an extra year. So the undergraduate law degree was a three-year degree. He started in 1913, and in some other scenario, he would have graduated in 1916, but he was very interested, he was a very good student, and so he stayed for an extra year for his master's degree. And what that meant uh, was that he graduated in the spring of 1917, which was just as the moment that the U.S. is entering the First World War and really going through a mass mobilization process. Now, many young men his age went and joined the military um, and went overseas to fight, but Hoover uh, went straight into the Justice Department he was a Justice Department employee for 55 years. He never had another employer. Um, and he went into the Justice Department in part because they were very, very actively looking for young lawyers who could help them handle this huge range of new responsibilities that were coming to the Justice Department as a result of the war. And that was everything from draft enforcement uh, to uh, enforcement of these new speech laws that had come in, into being, the Espionage Act, still on the books, uh, the Sedition Act in 1918 intended to crack down on wartime dissent, and then Hoover's first set of obligations were in the areas of uh, German registration and German internment, which are things that we tend to forget about. People know a lot about Japanese internment, but Hoover was there working on German internment. Um, so he's so good at this sort of thing, classifying large numbers of people, figuring out who is dangerous and who's not, particularly as this applies to non-citizens, that he gets this big promotion uh, at the age of 24 when he uh, the war comes to an end and Hoover gets a promotion, as you said, uh, to run this little thing called the Radical Division, which is a new experiment in the Justice Department in kind of political surveillance, keeping tabs on especially left-wing organizations in the United States. The Bolshevik revolution has just happened. There's a lot of concern about social disorder, the possibility of a revolution in the United States. And so 24-year-old J. Edgar Hoover um, is put in charge of figuring out what's going on. He writes some of the first ever government briefs on the new communist parties that are forming, uh, and he becomes an architect of the Palmer raids, which were deportation raids aimed at, at anarchists and communists. So I think from that, he gains uh, a few really key things. One is um, this kind of anti-radical and anti-communist sensibility, his sense that he is one of the great experts within the government on this question. Um, two are some of the techniques that he uh, uses for years to come, and he really looks back to this moment. And then the last one is that he actually comes under lots and lots of criticism, especially for the Palmer raids. The ACLU and other civil liberties groups are just forming during this period, and they really come after Hoover. Um, and that's sort of a cautionary tale for him. He survives it, but he spends a lot of his career kind of imagining, you know, what the civil liberties critique is going to be and either, uh, you know, trying to accommodate it and gesture toward it or to do things in secret so nobody ever finds out what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the photos that you use on the uh, title pages of your, of your chapters are wonderfully evocative. Uh, one of those photos uh, shows uh, what you describe as a publicity shot for the FBI in this early era. And it's not a shot, as you point out, of uh, 
agents with machine guns. We'll get to that photo a few chapters later. But in this uh, photo, it shows uh, FBI, a group of FBI agents in their uh, white shirts and ties uh, hunched over enormous file cabinets in a you know, giant warehouse-sized room. Um, why, and, and you use that, of course, to uh, um, de- uh, illustrate the Bureau in its early days. Why, why did Hoover choose to build a Bureau uh, reflected in that kind of photograph? Yeah, I love the filing cabinet photographs because during his early years as director, not only was his favorite publicity shot his guys standing at filing cabinets, but sometimes he just got rid of the guys altogether and was <laughs> <laughs> idling cabinets. Um, so why, right? What is this intended to symbolize? So he became head of the Bureau uh, in 1924 when he was 29 years old. Uh, he stayed in that job for the next 48 years died in that job in 1972, and we're going to get to that that, that <laughs> whole long trajectory. Uh, but that first decade when he's there from uh, 1924 into the mid-1930s is really a decade in which he's reforming and changing the institution in the ways that he thinks will be uh, most effective, in the ways that best fit what he thinks uh, its skill set ought to be. And of course, it's a tiny little organization at that point, right? A few hundred agents, a few hundred members of uh, the support staff, and that's it. And so Hoover's strategic problem as a young man is one that there have been some, you know, uh, con- corruption and patronage and excess problems. So he comes in as a reformer, promising that he's going to clean up all of that. But then he also has this question of what do you do in a position of federal power? that doesn't actually have much power. So they have a very weird grab bag of jurisdictions at that point. Uh, One of them, for those of you who have been uh, to the movies lately, uh, was crimes on Indian reservations. That's why Killers of the Flower Moon is something that the Bureau is involved in. Uh, They have a few other areas that they can do stuff in interstate prostitution. They get some jurisdiction over interstate auto theft, but it's a very weird bunch of things. And for the most part, law enforcement is happening at the local level. So Hoover sets out to kind of design the Bureau as this elite white collar force that is going to bring in the new practices of not only you know, file keeping, but science, professionalism, etc. So he starts hiring college graduates and explicitly lawyers and accountants, occasionally chemists and other scientists. Um, And he, during that decade, sets up many of the things that remain really important parts of what the FBI does. Uh, He pulls together the first national fingerprint uh, repository. So for local departments to look up to the federal government, do that. He gets control over crime statistics there really weren't very good crime statistics up to this moment. In the early 30s, Hoover says the FBI should be the one to gather crime statistics, um, and the FBI still does that when you get the uniform crime reports, right? That's because of what J. Edgar Hoover did in the 30s. He set up the FBI lab, right? Of course, this kind of famous cutting-edge uh, forensics facilities also in those early years. And then finally, he established Quantico. He established the FBI's uh, internal as well as external training academies um, in which he is bringing in local law enforcement officials and law enforcement officials from around the world uh, to be trained in his vision, his culture, uh, his FBI techniques. Interesting. You mentioned well, this one, uh, I, this question I would hardly consider a hardball, but I did not see the answer in the book, so I'll be curious. Um, you mentioned that you know Hoover, as, as you've just said here, constructed a quite... Uh, socially and culturally homogenous bureau. Uh, he was, you know, selecting uh, GW graduates like himself. Um, and uh, you say, you mentioned in the book, that one of the reasons he was able to do that is that the FBI had an exemption from civil service rules where, you know, they would have had to uh, open selection in, uh, to a more uh, or a less centralized controlled process. Do you know how they got that exemption and how long it lasted? So it lasted a very, very long time. I mean, it lasted all of Hoover's career. Um, And I never really was entirely able to suss out why they had it, except 
that the Bureau was created in a very, very sort of informal, ad hoc fashion. Um, and so it uh, it was created in, in 1908 in this very informal way. And I think, you know, there wasn't a lot of attention to it. it there wasn't, it didn't seem like a big deal in many ways. Um, and so, you know, I think it was mostly just an accident of history rather than any great thing. But it's incredibly important to how he's able to build the Bureau uh, because he can hire exactly the people that he wants. Uh, the people that he wants, you can imagine, are your vision of what an FBI agent, particularly a mid-century FBI agent, might be. Right, many of them GW graduates, but the tall white guy in a suit, right, conservative politics, highly professional, uh, spits shine shoes, the hat, the whole thing, right. And there's a reason that you don't think, um, you know, who was an employee of the Social Security Administration. You know, what's that type? <laughs> there are lots of reasons for that, but one of them is that Hoover, um, very differently from many other agencies, was able to hire only the type of person that he wanted to employ. And as you uh, show in the book, interestingly, although, as you say, of course, Hoover himself was conservative personally in, in a lot of the ways you described, yet um, two of the presidents he was closest to and who backed his efforts most enthusiastically were two liberal Democratic giants, FDR and LBJ. Um, so let's talk a little bit about FDR. Um, that was a big shift in Hoover's career. He'd been working under Republicans, uh, but then he flourished under FDR. Uh, what accounted for Hoover's ability to flourish during the New Deal and, and perhaps into World War II? Yeah, I think one of the most uh, amazing things about thinking about the arc of Hoover's career from our own uh, day and age uh, is not only that he kept this same job for 48 years, but that meant that he served under four Democratic presidents and four Republican presidents, right? And took great pride in being this quote unquote uh, nonpartisan official. So, just very quickly to, to tell you what this means so he's appointed under Calvin Coolidge, he stays on under Herbert Hoover, dawn of the Great Depression. They were not related. He's then there for three plus terms under Franklin Roosevelt. So, the New Deal into the Second World War, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. He stays on under Harry Truman in the late 40s and early 50s, so the early years of the Cold War, of McCarthyism. He stays on for both of Dwight Eisenhower's terms in the 1950s. He's there for John Kennedy. He's there for Lyndon Johnson, and he is there for Richard Nixon's first term and dies toward the end of Nixon's first term, still on the job, right? So it's an incredible sweep of time, and you know, in our highly partisan age, it kind of seems amazing that one figure could serve under this variety of people. So to your question about FDR in particular, um, one of the things that really surprised me in working on this was that uh, it really was the, the liberal presidents, uh, despite Hoover's kind of conservative ideology, who gave him most of his power, and the first among them, Franklin Roosevelt. The 1930s are really the age that the FBI becomes what we think of as the FBI today, which is to say it gets very expanded law enforcement power. They begin to carry guns, right? So you get the shift from the filing cabinet photos to the Tommy gun photos. Uh, that happens in the 1930s uh, as a result of kind of New Deal government expansion. It's also happening in crime and law enforcement. He becomes a big national celebrity because they launch all of these kind of PR initiatives. And then it's Franklin Roosevelt who urges him to go back into um, political surveillance, national security, um, beginning in the mid-30s. And then once the Second World War starts, the FBI gets its formal powers uh, in the areas of espionage, uh, domestic subversion, sabotage, um, and really becomes our kind of domestic political intelligence agency. One one uh, important episode in that, you talked about uh, FDR's interest in uh, increased political surveillance, concern about uh, extremists now not only on the left, but on the right as well, the Bund and uh, supporters of the Nazis and uh, enemies of the United States during the war. Um, but one of the striking examples, I thought, uh, of Hoover's caution about how he handled his new power 
uh, is uh, occurs in a brief mention you have about Japanese internment, where you note that Earl Warren, then governor of California, who we now think of as a liberal icon, uh, was an enthusiastic supporter of Japanese internment. And Hoover, who of course we think of as the <laughs> conservative uh, uh, opposite type from Warren, was much more skeptical and hesitant. Um, and that episode made me wonder about uh, uh, that that uh, theme of caution in how Hoover handled his federal power. Um, can you say a little bit about that? Because I think, again, we think of Hoover in terms of grasping power and expanding power. Um, what about this other side of Hoover uh, being rather cautious sometimes about how he exercised that power? Yeah, I'm glad that came through in the book because it was one of uh, the pieces that surprised me. Like many people, I came to thinking about him as kind of the ultimate power broker and empire builder, right? Always seeking new duties, always wanting to do more, always ready to be on, you know, the outer edges of um, of how federal power might be exercised. Um, and that's really not entirely true of him. He could be a very, very cautious person and he was very cautious about two things in particular. One was actually federal jurisdiction. <laughs> when he thought he didn't have jurisdiction over something, often he would draw quite uh, quite serious lines um, and refuse to do lots and lots of things. Um, and then the second was about wanting to make sure that the FBI was doing things that he thought it could be good at, right? That he had a very acute sense that you know, the FBI was actually quite a small institution um, and it could only be good at very particular kinds of investigations and that when the FBI took them on, he wanted them to, to be able to do them effectively. So he did not actually want a big sprawling organization, uh, which might be one that he couldn't control as much. Um, so he was, you're right, quite cautious. And one of the places that this shows up, this is one of J. Edgar Hoover's better moments, is that he's one of the few people in D.C. in kind of high government circles who actively opposes uh, Japanese internment in early 1942. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this, which are not so glorious in some sense. Uh, I do think that he did it for principled reasons a little bit. Uh, but it is also true that the FBI and the Justice Department had their own internment program that was already running that looked much more like the internment program of World War I that was much more individualized, right? And that had launched the day after Pearl Harbor. The FBI had been keeping tabs on uh, Germans, Italians, Japanese, who they thought were you know, A, non-citizens, and B, uh, potentially dangerous to the country. And they had gone and rounded them up and were running their own internment program. So Hoover thought that Japanese internment in the mass sense uh, was competing with the FBI. He sort of said, we, we can tell you who's dangerous. You don't need to round up everyone. I think he did think that it was a racially exclusionary program in lots of ways, uh, that were objectionable. Um, and he also just thought plain and straightforward that given that half of the people were being interned were American citizens, that it was just obviously unconstitutional and you couldn't do that to American citizens. You could probably do it to non-citizens. Um, and so, uh, you know, he, he registered his objections. He obviously didn't, didn't win that battle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, talking about, um, caution or seeking to expand, um, you know, as you note, during uh, FDR's uh, terms in office, the FBI uh, experiences enormous expansion and becomes, as you said, or really a domestic intelligence agency. But I gather during the war, Hoover did have some uh, hopes for the FBI becoming uh, more of an uh, intelligence agency outside the United States. And of course, did uh, engage in some operations in South America and some other places. But uh, by the time of Harry Truman, whatever um, hopes Hoover had of that uh, transformation of the FBI into a genuine central intelligence agency, <laughs> to, use, to use a term that, of course, um, gets attached to a different organization, fails. He's defeated. It's one of the few, uh, to me, striking bureaucratic defeats of Hoover uh, in the book. 
Um, how, how do you account for that, given his, you know, enormous uh, bureaucratic skills? Right. Yeah, it is the it is the great kind of bureaucratic defeat of Hoover's life. Uh, during the war, he and the FBI have been given jurisdiction over uh, not only the United States, but all of the Western Hemisphere. So they had set up shop throughout uh, South America, the Caribbean, etc., um, while the OSS, the sort of precursor to the CIA, is uh, given more global jurisdiction. But as the war is coming to an end, and the question is, what is a post-war intelligence scene going to look like? What kind of agencies are we going to have in peacetime? Uh, Hoover makes this bid, first to FDR, and then FDR dies, and then to, to Truman, that uh, everything should be in one house, and that house should be the FBI, that the FBI should take over jurisdiction of the world. Now, he had some actually interesting arguments about it. You know, he said that uh, the great question of the latter half of the 20th century is going to be communism in the Cold War, and that is an area where, you know, you have both a kind of domestic political party and kind of domestic adherence, and you also have uh, kind of all of these um, global questions, but in particularly on espionage, you know, you have to really be talking to each other. Uh, but of course, that was that was about as far as he could get. Uh, Harry Truman was very suspicious of the kind of concentrated power that Hoover wanted. He sets up the CIA instead, and then the FBI and the CIA um, kind of refused to cooperate, maybe ever since, but certainly uh, in the 40s and 50s. Yes. Um, let me ask you about another uh, program that was created uh, shortly after that and came to be very controversial, and that's COINTEL Pro, um, which I'll confess I thought of as this uh, FBI program from the 60s that was exposed by the Church Committee and is, you know, uh, focusing on, say, civil rights groups, uh, uh, infiltrating them and uh, radical student groups during the 60s. But I learned from your book that, of course, COINTELPRO has a different origin and different initial targets. Um, and also, I, I, from your account, COINTELPRO, even though uh, my image of it was this you know, rogue abuse, in its origins, it, it more fits the pattern of Hoover being careful to get <laughs> approval from his superiors before launching on potentially controversial Enterprises, tell us a little bit about the origins of COINTELPRO. Yeah, COINTELPRO is probably the most notorious program of Hoover's career. Um, it stands for Counterintelligence Program, and what the FBI meant by counterintelligence was not just surveillance, but active disruptive measures aimed at all sorts of political organizations that were considered to be beyond the pale. So, you know. Uh, planting informants, having the informants disrupt meetings, uh, planting, you know, scurrilous newspaper articles. They even employed uh, a, a cartoonist to draw cartoons, making fun of groups that they didn't like and having those published in the paper, right? Spreading rumors, uh, advocating violence in some cases, right? A whole host of active disruptive measures that were supposed to cause organizations and movements uh, to kind of collapse from within to so factionalism, et cetera. So it is most famous as something aimed as it was at the civil rights movement, at groups like the Black Panthers and at the student and anti-war movements in the 60s. But its origins are really interesting because its origins really are in uh, the Red Scare of the 1950s. And in fact, specifically, in a set of Supreme Court decisions in 1956 and 1957, um, in which the Supreme Court is sort of leading uh, the backlash against McCarthyism, against certain of the practices that the FBI had been using up to that point um, to uh, go after groups like the Communist Party and the Communist Party in particular. Um, and so Hoover is seeing that public opinion is changing, uh, the court decisions are changing, and so he says, well, look, we have to continue to go after them, but we're going to have to do it ourselves, right? We can't rely on the courts anymore. We can't rely on the politicians or even public opinion, so we're going to have to bring it in-house, and we're going to have to use these kind of secret disruptive techniques to try to get the Communist Party to basically collapse from within. So that's where they try out a lot of those techniques that are then extended to figures like 
uh, Martin Luther King, most famously, um, to the Panthers, to the anti-war movement, and actually also in the 60s to the Ku Klux Klan, to white supremacist groups, neo-Nazi groups, um, in terms of their techniques, they're doing a lot of the same things uh, all over the spectrum. Yes, and of course, you know, as you describe it, it is uh, quite similar in many respects to what our great Cold War adversary, the USSR, put under the uh, rubric of active measures, trying to disrupt in uh, often covert ways uh, ideological enemies. Right. So uh, it's an interesting parallel. Um, also, still just staying with Hoover in the 50s under Eisenhower for a moment, um, you know, one of your chapters is titled, I think, Patron Saint of the Far Right. And of course, at, at a certain point, Hoover uh, gains that image. But I think as your, your account shows, he really is uh, much more uh, a kind of Eisenhower Republican. Uh, th those are really his people, more than the far right. Um, he, he's really, uh, you know, the prototypical example of what Nixon calls the silent majority. Uh, in a lot of ways, in his outlook and his values, um, what was what was Hoover's relationship with the far right like, uh, especially say in that era, uh, folks like the Birchers, so on? Well, the 1950s were sort of the heyday of his popularity, and um, I think one of the things that was most striking to me in writing the book was simply uh, reminding people of the fact that J. Edgar Hoover was once very popular. <laughs> and in fact, in the 1950s, he was enormously popular, both among Democrats and among Republicans. Uh, he was widely hailed as one of the kind of most revered public servants in the country. You know, and this is a moment when almost anyone in Washington politics certainly is going to be describing themselves as an anti-communist Hoover is sort of the king of the anti-communists, and even in relation or comparison to someone like Joseph McCarthy, while Hoover and McCarthy had some things in common, uh, Hoover was often seen as the much more careful, much more institution-bound and law-bound player, and sort of the the responsible alternative to Joe McCarthy. So even many liberals and uh, civil libertarians are getting behind Hoover in the 50s because they think that he is the less bad option and that, you know, McCarthy is the demagogue and Hoover is the kind of team player. Um, and so the period of the kind of Republican establishment of the 50s is really his heyday. There's a, a whole Washington scene around, you know, Eisenhower and Nixon and Dulles and Hoover. They're all going to church together. <laughs> They're all socializing together. It's a very kind of D.C. establishment story. Um, but as time goes on uh, in the late 50s and then into the 60s in particular, opinion about Hoover uh, starts to become much more divided and much more partisan in lots of ways. Um, and it's in those moments that uh, Hoover develops this kind of funny relationship with the radical right. So like the John Birch Society which is founded in the late 50s, they love J. Edgar Hoover, right? They're like, he is our hero. They're assigning his books. They're valorizing him. And Hoover is saying, um, yeah, you know, maybe not so much. <laughs> uh, he's a little nervous that they are vigilantes, right? He thinks that the good professional FBI agents should be uh, doing the kinds of things that the Birch Society wants to kind of take over and do. And so he both wants that kind of support from the far right and then is also suspicious of it and at times uh, goes even further than that and, and conducts surveillance operations against uh, various right-wing groups. Yep. Uh, I've been marching through presidents a little bit. I'm going to jump over JFK uh, and go to that second great liberal Democrat, uh, FDR being the first, but LBJ being the second, with whom Hoover had an in, uh, intensely close and warm relationship, uh, both professionally and personally. I hadn't realized how warm the personal relationship was before reading your book. Again, how do you explain uh, that kind of uh, deep connection? between figures who we think of as so different. Right. Well, a little bit of it was happenstance, which is that uh, they lived on the same block 
Um, and so beginning in the 1940s, they were neighbors and the, the Johnson's two little girls would come up and, you know, steal flowers from Hoover's flower garden. They walked their dogs together and they, so they were part of the same social orbit, um, in very Washington ways. Um, and I think that though they did not share a lot of the same political ideas all the time, uh, they did share, you know, a deep respect for power and how power operated, um, and they were really allies on that front. So we do have Lyndon Johnson to thank for the fact that J. Edgar Hoover effectively became FBI director for life. Um, in another scenario, Hoover would have been forced to resign on January 1st, 1965, which was when he turned 70 years old and which was then the mandatory federal retirement age. Um, Lyndon Johnson becomes president uh, in the wake of John Kennedy's assassination. And one of the first things he does is go to his old friend, Edgar, and say, Edgar, you know, I'm going to exempt you from this. And they have a nice little ceremony in the Rose Garden, and Hoover is FBI director for life. But Johnson wants something back for that. And, you know, Johnson, really more than any other president, including Richard Nixon, um, used the FBI in highly politicized ways, uh, he asked Hoover to do what were effectively uh, political favors often, and though Hoover wasn't always thrilled about it, uh, he often did them. Now, some of those were kind of heroic, right? He, uh, when the Civil Rights Act is passed in the summer of 1964, he and Hoover come together and he says, you know, Edgar, we're going to show the world uh, that we're going to enforce this thing. Right. And the way that we're going to do that is that you are going to go down to Jackson, Mississippi. You are personally going to open a new FBI office in Jackson and you are going to show that like federal power is here to stay in the South and we're doing this thing. On the other hand, he is also asking Hoover to do totally outrageous things that involve a lot of spying on the civil rights movement, um, a lot of containing of civil rights activists. Uh, one of the most outrageous is that at the Democratic National Convention in 1964, uh, when Johnson is uh, almost certainly going to be the Democratic nominee, there are nonetheless uh, various civil rights protests going on there. And uh, Johnson goes to Hoover and the FBI in advance of the convention, and he asks them in a way that everyone acknowledges is pretty shady, maybe illegal, uh, says, I want you to spy. I want all your best informers here. I want you, you know, spying on Martin Luther King, wiretapping him, whatever you need to do. And I want that information coming back to me in the White House. So they set up this special squad of FBI agents to basically go spy on behalf of Lyndon Johnson. And they send him these uh, twice daily reports that he's getting in the White House that are just, you know, pure political intelligence that are just to help Johnson manage the convention. Wow. You mentioned, uh, uh, you know, surveillance of civil rights groups and of, uh, of King himself. Uh, of course, some of the story of the surveillance and harassment of King has become somewhat well known, uh, though, as you mentioned in the book, we're still waiting in, uh, for the release in 2027 of some very important additional FBI files that will tell us more about the campaign against King. But in, in your research, uh, were there new aspects of that effort that you discovered even before we get to the, the big disclosure in a few years? Yeah, the FBI's campaign against King in particular uh, takes up several chapters of the book, both because it was important in its own right and then I think is a lens into uh, what was happening um, to the civil rights movement as a whole, but uh, it's a campaign that starts out with a kind of national security logic, which is to say there are a couple of people in Martin Luther King's orbit uh, who had a long history with the Communist Party. It's not really clear that they actually broke with the Communist Party as they're becoming very close to King. And so, of course, this sets off all sorts of alarm bells at the Bureau. And the first people that they're surveilling are those uh, those figures in King's orbit. But very rapidly, that then produces uh, wiretaps on those figures, that then produces wiretaps on King himself. And coming out of that, by early 1964, the FBI is actually planting bugs in Martin Luther King's hotel rooms 
which is to say they're figuring out where King's going, what hotel he's going to be staying at. They're going in advance to the hotel staff saying, let us into the room. They're planting microphones there. Then they are listening from somewhere else in the hotel to what's going on in Martin Luther King's hotel rooms and recording it. Um, and what was going on was often a rather uh, capacious extramarital sex life. Um, so they are recording that and then sort of at the at the peak of their uh, harassment and surveillance of King in late 64, early 65, um, they actually take those those reels of recordings, they send them to King himself uh, along with an anonymous kind of dirty tricks letter purporting to be from a, a black admirer saying, you know, I thought you were this great minister of the cloth, but you're just this, you know, sexual beast. I mean, it's a really outrageous letter. I actually found the first unredacted copy of that letter um, for the book when I was doing this research, and it's it's quite outrageous. So if you go, if you Google it, and you see the full unredacted version, that's because... <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that that is kind of a story of uh, of escalation um, and of the ways I think that the FBI's um, secret programs were both secret and known to everyone involved uh, during these years. So the FBI is actually peddling all of this information around to the Washington Press Corps. Uh, most of them don't really want to touch it. Lyndon Johnson knows at, lives all of this. He loves this stuff. Uh, but yeah, what's coming out in 2027, which has been under uh, court uh, embargo for, uh, for the last 50 years, are the tapes themselves. Um, and the tapes themselves, uh, we don't really know what's uh, how how good the quality is or what's on them, but they're but they're pretty invasive um, tape recordings of Martin Luther King's private life. Mm. Um, we've been uh, working our way through Hoover's story chronologically, more or less, mixing in some of the larger themes. Let me let me step back from the chronology and ask you uh, a number of other questions about cross cutting uh, themes of the book. Um, one of them, I, though, or, or about uh, how you went about uh, researching and writing the book, um, one of them I'll jump to because you mentioned your acquisition of the unredacted version of that letter, and you mentioned in your note on sources that you filed dozens of FOIA requests to get some of the material for the book. Um, how, how responsive were your, <laughs> your FOIA targets, as it were? How much did you have to struggle to get uh, some of the records that you used in the book? Um, I did not deploy any grand uh, legal mechanisms. I did not sue the Bureau. I didn't do anything really outside of the normal FOIA process, which is pretty straightforward at this point. Um, I'd say the main issue with FOIA is, uh, well, I guess there are two main issues. One is that it often takes a really long time um, so you can file a request for information and you have no idea when you're going to get it. And it can be five years. I mean, this book took me a really long time. So, you know, I, I could wait out some of it, but not all of it. Uh, and then, of course, the nature of FOIA is that you have to be pretty specific about what you're asking for. And so if you want to learn about, you know, some secret set of things that might be going on, but you don't know what they are, it's really hard to file a FOIA request asking for them quite specifically. So, um, but in general, it was a very straightforward process. I think the main issues uh, with this kind of historical FOIA anyway are just kind of backlogs, uh, processing backlogs and the, the, the length that it takes to get some of it. Right. Um, so your book, of course, is a biography of Hoover, but it's also a story uh, as the you know second part of the subtitle uh, suggests about the making of the American century. Um, what would, if you, as you think uh, back on the work on the book and how how it uh, came out as you were forming your ideas, what are, what would you say are, you know, some of the biggest uh, lessons or, as we say in Washington, takeaways from the book in terms of, uh, you know, maybe about Hoover, but more about the development of the federal government in the twentieth century. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one is that Hoover represents a sort of way of being in government that I think uh, would be very hard to find and identify 
uh, certainly in our in our political world, but maybe uh, within the government itself as well, which is to say that he represented these two very powerful sets of political ideas. One, as I said, is this kind of progressive era vision of professional, nonpartisan career government service as you know, a noble enterprise, something worthy of deep investment and deep respect. Uh, he cared about that. You know, he often violated some of his own promises, but uh, he comes of age in this kind of progressive era tradition and is a real state builder. And then he's also, uh, you know, a serious ideological conservative. Um, and so he was interesting to me as a puzzle since we tend to think about uh, conservatives, and certainly in our own days of the Trumpy right, right, uh, that attacks on the FBI, attacks on the deep state, attacks on the administrative state, all of these things are so central to the kind of conservative and right politics of our moment that it's very hard to imagine a figure like Hoover um, who is combining those two traditions. I think it is still, that combination is still, I think, at the core of what the FBI is as an institution and, and its own internal institutional culture. Um, but I think it helps to explain why liberals could like him for some reasons, conservatives could like him for other reasons, and why he lasted so long. Um, so I think absolutely with Hoover, this is probably the most thing. It's a story about uh, some of the dangers of unaccountable power. Okay. <laughs> that when Hoover became FBI director, you know, it's this tiny little institution, and there really weren't very many mechanisms of accountability. And that remained the case, even as it grew and grew. So during Hoover's lifetime, there were, uh, you know, there were no intelligence committees in the Congress. Uh, there was no one, quite literally, and Hoover enforced this very seriously, uh, that had any ability to access the FBI's files or to see what was going on at the FBI. That included the Attorney General who ostensibly was Hoover's boss, but, you know, something like 17 attorneys general came and went during the time there was one J. Edgar Hoover. And, you know, so his ability to kind of control the institution and really to do things that uh, had to do with his own agenda that were often beyond the bounds of the law um, was a really a central part of his career. And we've had, you know, a variety of reforms since that I think give the FBI director much more limited power. Um, but that's an important part of the story. And the last one I would say is that I think you can't understand the broader politics of the 20th century, whether you're talking about kind of Washington politics and presidents, or whether you're talking about social movements and uh, how they have been able to succeed or be limited uh, without thinking about someone like Hoover. And so I think he's particularly important for the history of the left um, and for some of the roadblocks that left-wing social movements, whether you're talking about labor and communism or civil rights, uh, really ran up to and ran up against. And it's just important in our history to remember that the federal government uh, sometimes empowered those movements, but through the figure of Hoover certainly was often very, very actively engaged in uh, the process of uh, containing and disrupting them. You mentioned, of course, uh, Hoover's tremendous longevity in office. 17, I gather. No. <laughs> Only eight presidents, but 17 attorneys. General. Something like that. That might not be the exact number, yes. but it's, and it's, it's some order. In the, in the popular image, uh, an important part of the explanation for that longevity, uh, at least in my <laughs> <laughs> image, was uh, Hoover's ability to collect sensitive personal information on people and make use of that in all sorts of ways, whether helping political backers and, and harming uh, critics. Uh, you mentioned, of course, LBJ being an enthusiastic user himself of uh, that kind of sensitive personal information. And perhaps that's one of the reasons LBJ you know, was such a big uh, Hoover fan, was Hoover <laughs> supplying him with the kinds of information he uh, wanted. Um, how, how significant was that side of the FBI's work to keeping Hoover in, in office so long? And what, what were the other explanations for Hoover's achievement of that extraordinary tenure. Yeah, it's definitely a, a pretty substantial part of the story. I think the uh, the phrase that's often used is the idea that Hoover was blackmailing people, right? Blackmailing presidents and senators and congressmen and 
uh, other people. I think it wasn't quite that straightforward in the sense that the FBI's usual method was, you know, they'd find out about the sex life or drinking habits of Senator X and, um, and the usual method would be that probably not Hoover himself, but an FBI official or an agent uh, would be sent to that senator and say, Senator, we've found out, you know, this terrible thing about uh, your, your drinking habits. People are spreading these horrible rumors about you, and we just want you to know your secret's safe with us. <laughs> <laughs> so they would come in this kind of protective mode. Um, is it a threat? Of course. Uh, I guess the other things that I would say are that often they didn't actually have to have the goods, right? All you need is for everyone in Washington to think that you might know their deepest secrets, and that's just as good as actually having those secrets because they're going to behave uh, as if they do. And then the last thing I would say is that uh, while I do think this is a big part of Hoover's power, I think it's maybe become a little outsized in the public imagination. And what I wanted to do in the book was explore all of the other sources of his power, from his bureaucratic talents to his public relations, uh, to the fact that actually, as I said, he was really popular. So when you look at someone like John Kennedy, who really didn't like Hoover, but did not fire him, you know, you see a variety of things being said. And one of them is, oh, he's much too popular, right? We're going to get a rebellion even within our own party uh, if we try to fire J. Edgar Hoover. On the other hand, he also knew a lot about John Kennedy's sex life. <laughs> and there was a lot to know about John Kennedy's sex life. So there's that. Yes. And well, you mentioned one other element of uh, the source of Hoover's success uh, in uh, maintaining his position for so long, and that was his skill in publicizing the work of the FBI and casting the FBI as heroes. Uh, defending uh, the public against these terrible threats uh, with, you know, books like Masters of Deceit and uh, movies and ultimately a television show. Um, how, did, how did Hoover learn that side of the business and, and how important do you think that was in uh, his, his uh, uh, building up of the Bureau and his own position? Yeah, it was, it was really important. Um, and beginning in the 1930s, the FBI expended lots and lots of money and time and energy uh, on its PR division. And that meant everything from relationships with Hollywood, relationships with the press. They're constantly churning out, you know, J. Edgar Hoover on how to raise your children and J. Edgar Hoover on, you know, whatever issue of the day. Uh, and then it also meant cultivating popular constituencies. So uh, he had a big relationship with the American Legion, um, the American Legion conventions for a while were simply called FBI Productions. Uh, ultimately, they launched this TV show, right? So there are a variety of things that this means. And uh, one of them is that Hoover himself is this kind of legendary figure, right? He is just a household name for most of his career. Um, but I actually think there was also some beyond self-glorification and egomania, which was a lot of it. Um, he did often articulate a set of ideas that I think have some value. One is uh, the idea that the work of the government, and particularly the federal government, which is pretty far away from most people, that the work that the government is doing is not naturally legible to ordinary citizens. And if you want people to both understand what you're doing and then to support what you're doing, you're going to have to explain it and kind of sell it to them. And I don't think that he was wrong about that. Um, and then the other one was that he felt as a law enforcement official that uh, building up this image that the FBI was rock solid, invincible, incorruptible, trustworthy, would make people more likely to cooperate with you and was itself a kind of deterrent that if you think that you can't get away with something because, you know, federal agents are going to find you no matter where you are, then that actually serves a, uh, a law enforcement deterrent purpose. Um, so there was, you know, some logic behind the madness in addition uh, to Hoover's own desire to be the center of all things at all times to all people. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask a, a final question, uh, and I'm going to step away from Hoover and the book. 
uh, to ask you about uh, historians and the federal government <laughs> in the guise of uh, historians talking with presidents. Uh, I saw that you were part of a small group of historians who uh, maybe a little more than a month ago uh, or two months ago met with President Biden at the White House at his invitation. Uh, I'm sure there's many things about the conversation you can't say, but what can you tell us about uh, that meeting uh, between uh, a president and a group of historians? Yeah, that was the first time that I had done that. This is something that Biden has done a couple of times. I guess this is sort of the third, uh, the third round over the course of his presidency. I think Barack Obama did a little bit of this, uh, you know, and there are earlier examples in history of turning to historians to try to get some sense of uh, of what's happening and where you stand in history. Um, and so that was really the purpose of that meeting, which was in early January. Um, one was, yeah, to kind of have a moment to step back, particularly around the question of democracy and democratic crisis and how, you know, we want to think about this moment. Are we actually in, you know, some historically unprecedented crisis? Uh, if so, what elements of that really matter? Um, what do we have some precedent for? And then in this case in particular, uh, we were coming up on the anniversary of January 6th, and uh, he was preparing for uh, the speech that he gave at Valley Forge. And so we were also having a set of conversations about, you know, was January 6th really uh, really unprecedented. Um, and it's interesting for me as a historian to be in that position and have to try to think through uh, those sorts of issues. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was a it was a kind of stimulating and interesting conversation. I think we pushed we pushed a little bit um, to come out pretty forcefully um, in the speech against January uh, about January sixth. Um, but I think he probably would have done that anyway. <laughs> Very good. All right, I'm going to, uh, we have a little time left. I'm going to turn the questioning over to the floor. Uh, Professor Dickinson. Uh, so thank you for this really magnificent book and conversation. Fantastic. Um, I'm really struck at the end of the book how mm -hmm. you portray this very complex figure uh, and say that you know, we're probably right to build on Hoover. Sometimes when you vilify a person and it's here is the broader forces that seduce the person and they actually limit one's uh, and life. Um, and uh, Jonathan did ask lessons mm -hmm. of history question they find this tiresome, but um, I'm going to ask on two, um, which is, um, you know, about the ideal of the nonpartisan kind of government bureaucracy and particularly the national security, which I think is that, you know, the strong ideal of animated and we saw how he manipulated it and twisted it. And I guess the question is, what lesson do you seek from this? Is this a viable ideal or is it dangerous? And can we draw lessons? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say yes and yes. So, you know, when Hoover was acting in that capacity, um, which was certainly very much the part of how he presented himself from the moment that he became bureau director to the moment uh, that he died in that job, right? That this was kind of his highest ideal. Um, and moments that really produced, I think, something enormously valuable. I think he did professionalize uh, the FBI. I think he did actually make it, if not incorruptible, um, very much a place that was not simply uh, engaged in sort of patronage politics, right? Those were some of the problems that were trying to be solved, that Congressman X would come and say, hey, my nephew needs a job, you know, make him an investigator. <laughs> um, and I think that Hoover really did uh, solve many of those problems. Um, and it seems like a really valuable ideal to hold on to. And there were moments in his career uh, weirdly, especially under Richard Nixon, who was a very good friend of his, uh, in which the Bureau, because Hoover had a certain sort of apolitical autonomy, was able to say, no, we're not going to do this thing that you want us um, to do because we think it's outrageous or too political. Um, so there are moments when he when he's able to do that. Of course, there are 
many ways in which Hoover is sort of the worst example of the ways that that can itself become uh, corrupted, right? So I talked a little bit about the lack of accountability that was built in uh, to Hoover's own institution. I think the FBI became so enamored of its own internal culture and its own righteousness and its own sense that, you know, we're the guys who are really standing for the American way. We're the people who are champions of the American people, the politicians are just a bunch of nonsense. But that sense of righteousness uh, actually is one of the things that pushed them beyond the bounds, uh, not only of, I think, good policy, but sometimes of the law. Uh, and their internal culture, um, partly based on this professional ethos and partly based on some of the things that we were saying about Hoover uh, and his ability to choose his own employees, uh, you know, it produced a very insular kind of yes man culture um, that I think can also be a, a sort of hazard of that sort of thing. I mean, overall, I I, I think the the most redeeming parts of Hoover uh, do come out of his uh, championing of the idea of career government service as a noble enterprise, uh, as something that the American people should respect. Um, as something that serious professionals should aspire to, and as something that was worthy of government investment, right? That seems to me like those are those are the best pieces of what he did. Wait, maybe just mention your name. Absolutely, um, Professor Gage. My name is Arjun Singh. I'm a well part time student here at CW. I want to thank you for your remarks during the Q and A. The issue of sexuality came up quite a bit in your remarks of Dr. King, of President Kennedy. It's a rumor that J. Edgar Hoover was a gay man. Um, what I've read has never really confirmed this. You sort of believe that was the case, and how did it affect his official decision-making? And as somewhat of a corollary, another rumor is that he was uh, someone who liked to dress up in women's clothing. Uh, how did that also affect him visual life as well? Right. I think the, the main things that people tend to know about Hoover these days are one, the, the kind of blackmail stuff, two, the, the civil liberties abuses, and three, you know, so did he really wear women's clothing? Um, so on that one, we actually have almost no evidence that that would be true. That 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 idea, which uh, kind of came out in the, in the 90s, so to speak, um, came from a book that was written by a British journalist, um, and his main source for that was a woman who said that she had been at an orgy with Hoover and Roy Cohn, uh, and her husband, who was a, Roy Cohn was sort of a right-hand man of Joe McCarthy, she had been at a, uh, an orgy at the plaza with them, and that J. Edgar Hoover had shown up in, you know, this flouncy dress, et cetera, et cetera. So at any rate, she actually ended up serving time in, in prison for perjury in unrelated uh, things. So she's not a very reliable witness. And that is actually the source of that story. So maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But we just have no more evidence about J. Edgar Hoover than really anyone else on that front. I think the question of... Uh, his sexuality and whether he was a gay man is a much more complicated question. Um, so the basic facts of Hoover's life are that he never married, he never had children, uh, he never appears to have seriously dated a woman outside of a few kind of uh, PR moves, and the deepest and most important relationship of his life was with Clyde Tolson, fellow GW graduate, uh, part of that early generation of agents hired out of GW, um, and someone who by the 1930s had become the number two man at the FBI. So they had this very close personal as well as professional relationship that uh, extended well beyond the bounds of the Bureau. They traveled together. They uh, went to dinner parties together, they went to Broadway shows and nightclubs and socialized, they effectively were each other's social spouses, and it's clear that they deeply cared about each other 
um, and I would say loved each other um, in very intimate ways. For both men, this is the most important relationship of their adult lives. So what do we make of that? Uh, I guess the piece that in some sense was the most interesting to me was how open this relationship was, particularly in Washington, but also in the other two places, they like to spend time, one, the kind of Broadway cafe society scene of New York, and then in the L.A. area where they would go for uh, every summer they went together for vacation for a month in August, shared a cabana, hung out together, you know, double dated with Richard and Pat Nixon. Right? So uh, it's a very, very public a uh, widely respected relationship. Um, it is all over the newspapers. It is not hidden in any way. Uh, and it is not articulated, though, as uh, a gay relationship. Now, many people around them say they understood that this was a gay partnership, uh, but, uh, you know, it's certainly not being overtly described in that way. So what we don't know um, is how they themselves, in their deepest and darkest and most difficult moments really thought about this question. Obviously, neither one of them uh, overtly said publicly that they were gay and, in fact, were quite homophobic and investigated the sex lives of lots of other federal officials because it was against federal policy, against the law, to be gay and be employed by the federal government from the, from the 40s, really, through the early 70s. Um, and then the question of whether it's a sexual relationship you know, honestly, we just don't know. There are some uh, photographs that were kept in Hoover's private collection that are basically kind of vacation photographs, very intimate photographs of uh, of Tolson on vacation with Hoover, of the two of them together. I've reprinted some of them in there. I mean, they're just very intimate, but they're not um, overtly sexual. Um, so, you know, we kind of have to read the evidence that that we have. In another day and time, I think surely uh, they would have been gay men, I would think, but that was not the the day and time that they that they lived in. So it's a little hard to articulate. Please. Oh, hi there. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and for spending better part of a decade with guy. Um, uh, I think my question actually... Uh, my name is Eric Burstein. I'm a while student. I'm just working off that question that I think because of his part of homosexuality, I think it's very easy, and this is a tendency in a lot of discussions historically and the uh, present day about the American right um, to kind of uh, pathologize or psychologize some of the ideas these people represented. So I guess I was just, I, my question really is for you as a historian, how do you avoid those pitfalls? How do you strategize around that in terms of trying to understand the historical figure in that way. Yeah, I definitely didn't want to write a psychobiography, in part because I'm not trained to do so, <laughs> in part because, you know, it's very hard to to do that at a, at a centuries removed from someone you've never met or spoken with. Um, I think there were certain moments where I felt like I could lean into uh, psychological questions or at least temperamental questions. Um, in ways that the evidence seemed to support. Um, one was about uh, the ways in which so much of the culture of Hoover's childhood is about anxieties of masculinity, right? In the early 20th century, there's this thing called the boy problem, right? And the boy problem is that American boys are becoming, you know, weak and soft. And they're going to work in offices instead of in the fields or on the battlefield. And, and so Hoover's whole childhood is sort of in a swirl of that kind of anxiety about masculinity. And the men in his family are particularly problematic actors on this front. Uh, his father in particular, who is um, mentally ill um, in ways that's a little hard to tell from our historical distance, but seems to have suffered from pretty severe depression, seems to have actually died of depression, uh, but certainly was not you know, a Teddy Roosevelt figure of robust masculine health charging forth into the world. So I do think um, those sets of early anxieties about masculinity, about how you show the world your manhood, 
uh, go on to very much shape the culture of the FBI, how he creates his agent corps, etc. And then there were a couple of moments um, where I felt like I could get a little bit into Hoover's own psychology. My uh, my favorite was that in the early 1950s, he's on vacation with Clyde in L.A., and they're, um, you know, as one does with one's significant other, they're going to the farmer's market and going around for getting ice cream and sort of traipsing about together. And a reporter decides to fault recognizes them and decides to just follow them and see what they're doing, follows them into a bookstore. Clyde buys a couple of kind of lurid westerns that he wants to read. And Hoover buys these two books by a psychologist named Karen Hornay, a uh, pretty prominent psychologist at the time. And uh, there are two books. One is called uh, Our Inner Conflicts. <laughs> And the other one is called self-analysis, right? <laughs> and you open them up, and the central problem of our inner conflicts is like, what do you do in the world when the self that you have created and presented to the world is so deeply at odds with the private person that you know yourself to be? And the ways in this which this produces, you know, sometimes monomaniacal behavior, a desire for rigid control of those around you. And it's just like this kind of, you know, incredible work to think. Now, do, did Hoover ever read it? Was he buying it for his own personal psychology? I don't know, but it was such a good opportunity to say, <laughs> perhaps we can read something in so there are moments where where i did get into it but i tried to be pretty pretty cautious about that stuff all right one one final question oh i have, I have so many print hands but i think i think this handles up first just, yeah so my name is jacob hetzer so i was a little curious you mentioned uber one rather than the day how the fbi acquired sort of four intelligence capabilities and then lost that fight so i'd be kind of interested in in relationship with alan dulles given that so it was who were at like the height of his powers and Dallas, much shorter tenure, but kind of like a Hoover-like figure in a way, what the relationship professionally, as well if there was one personally, what that was like. Yeah, so when Hoover, I uh, said during the Second World War, they have jurisdiction over South America, the FBI has set up this whole thing called the Special Intelligence Service, he wants to expand it, and Truman basically says no, we're going we're gonna to set up the CIA instead, and you have to shut that down. Uh, now, Truman's vision and the vision of the uh, other intelligence officials was that there would be a seamless transition in which, you know, the FBI would hand over its offices to these new actors. And Hoover basically is like, no way. <laughs> and so um, he uh, very rapidly shuts down everything. Uh, he uh, burns all of the files. Um, he tells them, if we're not good enough to do it, then come in and do it yourselves, you know, screw you, and hauls all of his guys back here within, like, I don't know, 